president said, well, he wanted to examine those specifically for Iraq, and that Rumsfeld was not to talk to anyone else, including the CIA director. The old Iraq war plans were kept in Florida at Central Command Headquarters, CENTCOM. Four-star General Tommy Franks was in charge. There's a term in the Army that's not always used as a form of praise, calling somebody a muddy boots soldier. And I said the word soldier, S-O-J-E-R. Just kind of, yep, he's a good muddy boots soldier. And it typically is used as a compliment, but not always. Well, everybody always said to Franks, yep, he's a muddy boots soldier. It's a good guy to have on your flank if you're a battalion commander in a tough fight. It also tends to mean he's not a deep thinker. He's not one of those guys who goes off to the war college to read Clausewitz. He goes off to the war college to play some golf. The challenge here for Rumsfeld is he's got a guy who comes really out of the classic army background who's going to think, yep, you know, let's go in big and heavy. General Shinseki and Secretary of the Army White had no operational authority over specific war plans. This would be a game of one-on-one, -on -one, Rumsfeld against Franks. The most recent Iraq war plan, based on the success of Desert Storm, called for overwhelming force, weeks of heavy air bombardment, and seven months advance warning. Rumsfeld asks General Franks, uh, let's see, you kind of have 30 days to give me your views, and then they're on the phone saying, no, come up in three days. Rumsfeld is, let's do it now, let's focus on it. On the Army side, of course, there was once again great resistance to the notion of using Army forces in, for an intervention in Iraq. There was no real enthusiasm at all at high levels in the Army for this idea. Colonel Douglas McGregor was a tank commander in Desert Storm. His specialty is thinking outside the box about military tactics. He's a well-known maverick in the military establishment. After Rumsfeld's early exposure to Tommy Franks, he went looking for fresh ideas. He came across Colonel McGregor. In early December, McGregor was invited to the Pentagon. Brought me in and asked, uh, uh, we're looking at Iraq. The, by the way, the Chief of Staff of the Army says it will take at least 560,000 troops to deal with Iraq. Well, of course, I burst out laughing immediately. The representative said, that's interesting because that was Secretary Rumsfeld's reaction. McGregor had a powerful ally helping him gain access to the secretary. He showed us an email. It was from former House Speaker Newt Gingrich to Secretary Rumsfeld. As a member of the Defense Policy Review Board, Gingrich had become a close advisor to Secretary Rumsfeld. He had championed Colonel McGregor's work. Newt, I looked at this piece you sent from McGregor. I don't know anyone who is thinking that way. Thanks, D.H. Rumsfeld. But this whole thing with Gingrich, with McGregor feeding him ideas, became a very, very contentious aspect of our relationship, I think, that polluted the well. General Shinseki's position was army doctrine. Large numbers of forces were necessary to secure a country immediately after a conflict. But he couldn't get through to Rumsfeld, who had Newt Gingrich talking to less traditional planners like Colonel McGregor. He said, what do you think? And I said, 50,000 troops. Real emphasis has to be on getting rapidly to Baghdad on a couple of axes and using mobile armored forces for that purpose. And once we get there, we remove the government. So the bottom line is the secretary is right, the enemy is very weak, this will not take very long. At which point in time I was told, well, great, uh, can you put together a plan? This is Colonel McGregor's war plan. 50,000 troops rapidly deployed, striking at the heart of Baghdad. I uh, received a call from CENTCOM, uh, from General Frank's uh, staff group director, who was a full colonel, who said, the Secretary of Defense has directed the boss to bring you down to uh, CENTCOM for three days. If you're a warfighting general, CENTCOM is where you want to be. Norman Schwarzkopf was the boss here during Desert Storm. Then, Marine General Joe Hoare took over. 50,000 people, I know what my answer would have been. I can't say it on public television. This is a labor-intensive business. In, 
if you're going to go in and change a country of 25 million people, you've got to have boots on the ground. The people that are making decisions in the military, the guys that are in uniform, think very seriously about having one American soldier or Marine killed. And the way you minimize casualties is you fight aggressively and with overwhelming strength. And so when you sod up the road to Baghdad, you have enough people to flood that city, that city that's second only in size to New York City in terms of how big it is. Also, six and a half million people. 50,000 people, where would they go in Baghdad? What would they secure? Even if they were successful, how would you manage all of that? What, what would be the next step? I, I think it's absolutely impractical. But the more the generals dug in, the harder Rumsfeld pushed. And in the war planning, there are endless sessions, you know, hours and hours of Franks and Rumsfeld and Franks and Rumsfeld with the NSC or with President Bush going through the details and charts and slides and these are the assumptions and this is how many troops we might send. It might take 90 days here or we're going to try to get it down to 30. It's the kind of microscopic detail that's reviewed at the Rumsfeld level. It's quite astonishing. But Franks wants still several th hundred thousand troops to go in. And Rumsfeld has this process where he kind of chips away and chips away at this belief, asking questions. Why do you need that? Why do you need that? The Pentagon dubs this the iter iterative process. But it really, I think, is more a process of erosion. Some thought it had about it the echo of earlier civilian involvement, like the role civilians played in planning and operations in Vietnam. I've heard stories again and again of Rumsfeld actually crossing off individual units from deployment plans saying, you really don't need this, you don't need this. Finally, after a few months, Rumsfeld's persistence began to pay off. Franks, who declined to be interviewed for this program, was wavering. The Army looks upon this process, I think with a little bit of horror, during that period of war plan formation. I remember one day, a general said to me, Tommy's drunk the Kool-Aid. And that meant, yeah, Franks has gone over to kind of the belief in a smaller, narrower force. Franks sided with Rumsfeld. I think one thing that people underappreciate is even if you're a four star, and even if you have di disagreements with your civilian boss, when the boss uh, rules, which he does in our society, you're going to be a good soldier and go along with that, and you're not going to show the public that there's any dissent. I'd like to think I would have stood up and said no. I'd like to think I would, but I, I can't say that I would have. I don't think it's at all easy to go and tell the Secretary of Defense that he's wrong. When the Secretary of Defense and the Undersecretary and the Assistant Secretaries are all there in the room and they're telling you this is the way the plan ought to go, this is the way the plan ought to go, that's the difficult part of it. But Rumsfeld had also modified his position in the back and forth. So after 10 months in development, the new Iraq war plan called for 140,000 men, a rolling start in Kuwait, rapid deployment to Baghdad. It was neither Rumsfeld's plan nor the Army's. I think the plan was less transformational and daring than Rumsfeld hoped it would be. Uh, it was a hybrid. It was uh, a lot of the old and some of the new, probably more of the old than Rumsfeld would like to acknowledge. <laughs> 